On this Monday night, the pause in fighting in Gaza extended for two more days. Relief as more hostages are freed. We want all hostages back home now. And how Hamas could benefit from six days of calm. A doctor who spent weeks in Gaza trying to save lives. More areas were just completely, completely pulverized. What he witnessed and what he wants the world to know. Another deadly case of sextortion, the plea from the parents of this 12-year-old BC boy to talk about online predators. Plus, from air guitar to arguing, the animals putting the wild in wildlife. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. It is, one Israeli family says, a little light in the darkness. Eleven more hostages held in Gaza are free tonight, transferred from their Hamas captors to the hands of the Red Cross, including two mothers, two three-year-old twins, and seven other children. Their fathers, it's believed, remain hostage. As part of that deal, 33 Palestinian civilians detained by Israel have been released in the West Bank. This four-day pause in fighting has held, and tonight there is word it will now be extended for two more days. Though Israel's defense minister said tonight any further negotiations with Hamas will take place under Israeli fire. Eric Sorensen begins our coverage tonight. Monday night in the West Bank, a Red Cross bus and Israeli security personnel prepared for the release of 33 more Palestinian prisoners. From Gaza, Hamas video shows the transfer of what's believed to be 11 more hostages, among them twin three-year-old girls taken from a kibbutz. And now Qatari and Egyptian negotiators are credited with getting an agreement for a two-day extension so more hostages and prisoners can be exchanged. <coughs> They are heart-tugging moments, children reunited with their parents in Israel. <laughs> and in this Palestinian home, a father hugs his two sons. It is the one major development in the conflict that finds substantial support on both sides. In Gaza, where they wait in line for hours just for flour, they are desperate for the pause in fighting not just to be extended, but made permanent. We don't want war at all, says this woman in Gaza. A permanent truce, says this woman. People want to go back to their lives. In Tel Aviv, Israelis demanding that hostages be the priority also back a ceasefire extension. Whatever it takes, and as long as we keep on getting them back home, I want the ceasefire to continue, and I want to do whatever is needed to have all of them back home. U.S. President Biden welcomed a longer ceasefire, stating he remains deeply engaged to ensure that this deal can continue to deliver results. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel's goals remain the release of hostages and the elimination of Hamas. Still, the U.S. and Israel fear that Hamas is using this time to reorganize and rearm. This is a calculated risk that Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet are willing to take in order to get those hostages out. It's believed the ceasefire cannot and will not last. Israel's defense minister vowed to return to fighting within days and throughout Gaza. Eventually there's only so many hostages that Hamas can trade away. And then at that point, the Israelis have already given their orders to resume major combat operations. It's also not clear Hamas would release all the hostages and lose the negotiating leverage they currently have. But for now, a brief respite, extended two days, and welcomed by many on both sides. Eric Sorensen, Global News. The anguish of those waiting for word on their loved ones for weeks now is impossible to imagine. The families of those who have their relatives back are not celebrating. It's too early when so many others are still captive. But there is at least some relief. Mike Drolet has the stories of some of the families reunited. No words were needed. Mayan Zin hugging her two girls, ages 15 and 8, after their release from captivity is enough. For 51 days, all she had was hope and a few photos and video that showed Ella and Daphna were still alive. But now it's been so long, I'm starting to lose it again. For his part, Avi Brodich never stopped talking. He had set up outside the Israeli Defense Ministry with a sign reading, My family is in Gaza. They're now back, the angst on his face replaced with relief, now that he can touch his wife and three children again. And then there's four-year-old Abigail, whose parents were killed on October 7th. 
She fled to a neighbor's home for safety, only to be captured by Hamas. Today, she's all smiles in the arms of her relatives. It was wow. I couldn't believe it until I saw her, says her grandfather. The relief in his voice tinged with sadness at the road before her. In the West Bank, newly released prisoners were carried on shoulders through the streets. The unbridled joy of freedom interrupted only by a mother needing to touch her son, Khalil Zamare, again. Celebration for Palestinians, relief for Israelis. The politics of what brought them to these moments set aside, however briefly, for a little dose of humanity. Mike Trelay, Global News, Toronto. The ferocity of the bombing, the number of wounded in such a short period, it just is larger than the scale of anything that I'd seen. Because of the siege, because of the number of wounded, the health system is going to collapse. That is Dr. Hassan Abu Sitta, a British-Palestinian surgeon who I spoke to from Gaza in mid-October. He arrived there October 9th to help in Gaza's hospitals, and he worked nonstop. He is back in London now and wants the world to know what he witnessed. Crystal Gamansing spoke with him, and a warning, the images are distressing. A shanty town for internally displaced people is how Dr. Ghazan Abu Sitta describes what used to be Gaza's main hospital. It was one of several facilities where Dr. Abu Sitta spent weeks trying to help injured Palestinians. As the war progressed, more areas were just completely, completely pulverized, really unrecognizable. Parts of Gaza that I'd seen multiple times became completely unrecognizable. Also unrecognizable, Dr. Abu Sitta tells Global News the standard of care he and others were forced to utilize. Supplies ran out, but the injured kept coming, as did those seeking safety. This is what he told Global News on October 15th while at Al Shifa Hospital. And with the hygiene and with the unseasonably warm weather, this is a typhus or cholera epidemic waiting to happen. He recalls wounds infected with fly larvae and worms and how, out of desperation, he turned to a shocking quick fix. Did you go buy dishwashing liquid and vinegar? I just bought some hand soap, but we were just going through them so much that I went out and just bought locally manufactured dishwasher uh, soap. Uh, 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 and as we started seeing more and more infected wounds, uh, I started buying uh, bottles of vinegar to clean and disinfect infected uh, uh, wounds because we just didn't have what, what we needed anymore. And every day you felt that you were sinking further and further into this quicksand. A confession from a surgeon who worked in 12 war zones in the Middle East, including Iraq and Yemen. He fears Gaza is being turned into what he calls an uninhabitable death world, saying the majority of victims he saw were women and children. If we end up from this war living in a world where it's okay to do this, then that world will become a, 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 a dangerous place. The International Center of Justice for Palestinians says it has launched a war crimes investigation unit and is gathering evidence against Israeli officials and anyone promoting or encouraging violations of international laws. The organization says Dr. Abu Sitta will be meeting with British law officials to share what he's witnessed. Donna? All right, Crystal Gamansing in London, thanks. Elon Musk, who faced a backlash after agreeing with an anti-Semitic post on his social media site, went to Israel today. He met Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and visited places Hamas attacked on October 7th. The two men didn't publicly discuss anti-Semitism, but Israel did reach a deal to deploy Musk's Starlink satellites in Israel and Gaza for use by internationally recognized aid organizations, but only with the approval of the Israeli government. In Vermont, a 48-year-old man has been charged with three counts of attempted murder after three young men of Palestinian descent were shot on the street of a small city. Investigators are still working to determine if it was a hate crime, which, as Jackson Prosco reports, are on the rise in the U.S. This suspected act of hate unfolded in a quiet corner of Vermont. 
where three Palestinian students wearing kafiyas were attacked by a man with a gun. He stepped off a porch and produced a firearm and began discharging that firearm. The men were all seriously wounded but are expected to survive. Police quickly arrested the suspect, 48-year-old Jason Eaton. Mr. Eaton enters he pleaded not guilty to three counts of attempted murder. One of the victims, Hisham Awartani, was from Ramallah in the Israeli-controlled West Bank. My husband is devastated because he sent my, hus my son to the States for an education and he thought it would be safe. Though prosecutors suspect this was a hate crime, they can't yet be certain. Since October 7th, both Muslim and Jewish Americans have reported a dramatic rise in hate incidents, including the murder of a six-year-old Palestinian boy near Chicago. People are changing their behaviors. Uh, they're changing the way they look and the way they dress uh, because they are seeing so many other people being on the receiving end of attacks. Federal officials have repeatedly warned the conflict in the Middle East has raised the risk of terrorism and targeted violence on American soil. There is understandable fear in communities across the country. As the investigation unfolds, what happened in Vermont supports the worst fears of many, a sense that no place is immune from the rising tide of hate. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Police in Montreal are investigating vandalism at a Jewish community center. Early this morning, a Molotov cocktail was thrown through the glass door of the Jewish Community Council office. Nobody was inside at the time, but two Liberal MPs had been there hours earlier discussing security concerns with Jewish leaders. Police in Montreal have reported an increase in hate crimes targeting both Jewish and Muslim communities since October the 7th. A grieving family in B.C. is going public with a plea to other parents after what happened to their 12-year-old son. Prince George RCMP say their investigation revealed the boy took his own life in response to sextortion. As Angela Jung explains, his parents say they had no idea their son was being blackmailed. You had the heart of cold. No dry eyes as Nicholas Smith thinks about her 12-year-old son, Carson. He was just happy. He was a happy all-around kid. <laughs> they say he was using Snapchat, but they had no idea he was being blackmailed until it was too late. Sending pictures um, and being threatened if he didn't give money or give cards. On October 12, Carson took his own life. The RCMP investigation revealed Carson was a victim of sextortion. Though the investigation continues, police have not identified a suspect. Now his parents are sharing their story, raising awareness of the dangerous predators targeting youth. I would want every kid to know that it's okay, don't be embarrassed, don't be scared, come out, talk to somebody, talk to a grown-up, talk to an adult, talk to a counselor or an RCMP officer. The people on the other end of the chat are con artists and they are incredibly good at what they do. They don't have emotion, they don't have feeling, and all they want is to separate the person they're talking to from their money. Amanda Todd took her own life after suffering in silence for years. Her abuser was sentenced to 13 years behind bars. Since Amanda's death, law enforcement agencies have seen an increase in online sexual abuse. The majority of victims are boys between the ages of 13 and 18. It is truly terrifying to have this happen to you. There is no safe place. There is nowhere to retreat from these images and the harassment that follows them. Carson's family wants victims to know there is hope. Talk to somebody. It's not as bad as it seems. A message they wish they could have told their son. Angela Jung, Global News, Burnaby, B.C. A fourth person has died after a shooting in a downtown Winnipeg home early yesterday morning, and police say no one has been arrested. This is a, a dangerous offender, in my view, and, uh, you know, we must do everything that we can to identify that person and take them into custody. Police were called to a Winnipeg home just after four yesterday morning. A man and a woman were pronounced dead at the scene. Another man and woman died in hospital. And a fifth person, a 55-year-old man, remains in critical condition. Police are asking anyone with information or access to surveillance video in the area to contact them.
Alberta's premier makes her move. Coming up, how Danielle Smith intends to push back against the federal government's proposed clean electricity rules. Plus, the powerful storm pummeling war-torn Ukraine. And Miriam Webster keeps it real with its word of the year. If uh, the federal government doesn't back down, you bet we are going to find a way to get natural gas on stream. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith has invoked her Sovereignty Act legislation as she continues to push back at the federal government over its clean electricity regulations. Heather Urich's West explains how she intends to try to get around Ottawa's plans. Alberta's government is committed to protecting Albertans from federal overreach. And so, for the first time since introducing the controversial legislation last year, Alberta is invoking its Sovereignty Act. With a resolution calling Ottawa's plan to bring provincial electricity grids to net zero by 2035 harmful to Alberta. It asks Cabinet to order all provincial entities to refrain from enforcing or complying with the proposed federal electricity regulations. But it doesn't stop there. Because the Sovereignty Act cannot compel private companies to break federal laws, Smith says the province will consider setting up a crown corporation that would invest and operate electricity fired by natural gas. For a Conservative government that champions private enterprise and limited government interference, it's a surprising step, but not enough to move the federal environment minister to stand down. We will continue moving ahead with this. Uh, there is no legal basis for what Alberta is, 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 is doing. And we feel uh, that we're on very solid ground. And the fact that we already have some provinces who are on board with us, as well as a number of private companies and investors who say that this is the way to the future. It's the kind of thing that will drive away investment from Alberta in all sectors of the energy economy. The Pembina Institute says according to its own modeling, Alberta could reach Ottawa's clean electricity targets without compromising grid stability or affordability. But that's only if the province's renewable energy sector, which has already been subjected to a six-month pause, is allowed to grow. When I talk to these companies, and, and uh, they're looking elsewhere right now. We hope that the federal government backs down. A game of chicken with Alberta's electricity future in the balance. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Still ahead, seeking clarity on the number of foreign workers at an Ontario electric vehicle battery plant. As the war in Ukraine rages on, the fighting has been complicated by a fierce winter storm. Hurricane force winds, heavy snow and flooding have knocked out power to nearly 2 million people in parts of Ukraine and Russia. The storm is hitting as tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops stationed on the front lines fend off Russian forces. There are fears Moscow will target Ukraine's power grid in the winter months ahead. An emergency meeting was held in Ottawa today about hiring practices at an electric vehicle battery plant being built in Windsor, Ontario. Conservative MPs want the federal government to release details of the contract for the $15 billion project because of conflicting information over how many temporary foreign workers will be employed. Mackenzie Gray explains. It's one of the biggest corporate subsidies in Canadian history. It'll deliver for workers, It'll deliver for communities. It'll deliver for our economy. $15 billion will be given to carmaker Stellantis and South Korean tech company LG to build an electric vehicle battery plant in Windsor, Ontario. But the estimated 2,500 jobs created is now in dispute after temporary foreign workers have been brought in to get the plant built. Figuring out how many has been a challenge. There's one temporary phone worker that's been approved for this project. We've only had less than or fewer than 100 people that have come in. Anyone who's guessing numbers, they don't know really what they're talking about. You have to talk to the engineers. Windsor police had said it would be 1,600 workers, but the final number is nearly half that. There will be 900 Korean workers that will come in and help us, but there will be 700 Canadian trades. Address some of the... The uncertainty leading the Conservatives to push for the contract to be made public. Canadians deserve to know how their money is being spent. Bringing specific people to Canada with proprietary knowledge is not unusual for auto projects. This kind of approach to launching uh, automotive plants, be they battery plants or assembly plants, is not new. 
Neither is the Canada-South Korea Free Trade Agreement, which allows companies like LG to bring in South Korean laborers without following temporary foreign worker rules. That's why we signed the agreement originally, to allow for that. But I think what complicates things is the large amount of government funds going to support the project. Once the plant has been built, there may be bigger problems. Stellantis' is CEO now saying the electric vehicle market may soften Donna with potential political and regulatory changes in the U.S. and Europe. Okay, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa tonight. Thanks. Next, some of the wild and wacky winners of this year's Comedy Wildlife Photography Award. America's oldest dictionary is getting real. It's chosen authentic as the 2023 word of the year, as the line between what's real and fake gets increasingly blurred. Miriam Webster says there was a substantial rise in online searches for authentic, driven by interest in artificial intelligence, identity, and social media. Authentic is defined as not false or imitation and true to one's personality, spirit, or character. Other top searched words in 2023 are Riz, short for charisma, plus deep fake and coronation. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Here's something I learned in 2023. There are comedy wildlife photography awards. It's all authentic. And the winner in 2023 is this kangaroo jamming out on an air guitar. There are a lot of other funny animal pictures too. It's an antidote to negative and depressing pictures of nature, and the money from licensing these images goes towards grassroots conservation organizations. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.